Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Good day, Scott. Oh, right, you're going to Australia. Oh, and by the time they're hearing this, I'll be in Australia. Put another shrimp on the barbie. Hello, nice lady. You know, I'm not a big fan of shrimp. Well, there you go. Yeah. I just came back from Dallas where I went to a hockey game with the folks from All Crime No Cattle, Shay and Aaron, and some other friends like Kathy Warren, a member of the Umbriard. We had a great time, and we even went to the Dealey Plaza Museum to see where President Kennedy had been shot from the sixth floor of the book depository. That museum is worth the price of admission. Check it out. Yeah. We're going to change up our intro a little bit. We're always growing. We're moving pieces around, removing some and adding others. We have to start with a disclaimer, though. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on any of the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. See, I removed the uh, Nanaimo I bar and double double. But I know I'm sure the listeners are like panicking right now. The Mike. reason I did that is because that's dessert. Oh, oh, well, it is. Yeah. So we will say that still, but it'll be more toward the end of the episode. Okay, but I usually eat dessert first. I feel like I'm perpetuating a diet that will lead to type two diabetes. <laughs> Sometimes so. my my whole uh, main course is dessert. There you go. Yeah. Me too. Cake. This is episode 52. I felt cold researching and writing this one. <laughs> it doesn't help that the temperature outside is actually quite cold as well. I had to put on warm socks, oh. a sweater, oh. and my toque. Mm. Yeah. Wow, like you're really living up to... The Canadian thing? Yeah. How familiar are you, Scott, with this little bit of dark history that we're talking about? Not overly. Not, Not overly? Just, I just know the common folklore and whatnot that goes along with it. Sure. This one's a chiller. I see what you did there. Yeah, I see what I did there. There's gold. In 1845, an expedition led by experienced explorer, British Naval Rear Admiral Sir John Franklin set off northward in two ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror. There was a total of 134 souls aboard. Their intent was to discover the fabled Northwest Passage between Europe and Asia through what has become the Canadian Arctic. This was at the time the most expensive expedition to date. Britain wanted to show off its imperial power by solving the centuries-old puzzle, throwing all its financial, colonial, and technical might at the problem. It was a major point of pride for Britain and Sir John Franklin himself to find a route through the ice. As the phrase adapted from Proverbs goes, 
pride goeth before a fall. Both ships were lost, as were all the men on board. Subsequent searches over the ensuing centuries turned up bits of evidence pointing to a disastrous end to Franklin, his men, and their ships. These explorers faced unpredictable, sometimes torturously cold Arctic weather, extreme solitude, fatigue, unexplained illness, death of crewmates, and gnawing starvation that experts believe drove some to cannibalize the recently deceased. For almost 170 years, the fate of the two ships remained a mystery. Although initially discounted early on, there were stories told by Inuit oral traditions of these ships and their men. These tales would later assist more recent researchers in their quest to find Erebus in terror. This is Icebound, the story of the lost Franklin expedition. So, I mean, like, right off the bat, when you name one of your ships Terror, I'm just saying, like, that's maybe a bit uh, foreshadowy. Well, I think they meant to instill terror, not to <laughs> well, not, not to have it turned inward. <laughs> well, maybe they should have thought that through that. Terror isn't only One Direction, man. One Direction is a terrible band. Well, they, which strikes fear in me. <laughs> exactly. The Vikings had been the first Europeans to discover the northern parts of North America in the 10th century. In particular, they explored some places in the Arctic region we're talking about, like Ellesmere Island. It's presumed they may have ventured as far south as Nova Scotia and even the northern U.S. seaboard. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, looking for a western trade route to Asia. You kind of just wrapped. I did. The overland journey east to what was then called the Orient, or Cathay, was fraught with danger and it took a really long time. Sailing around the Horn to Africa to the south also had its perils, and it too was way too long and expensive in the way of ships and crew. Columbus, who passed away in 1504, only 12 years after his first voyage, refused to believe he had discovered a new continent. He died thinking he had been exploring Asia. I did not know that. Okay, I did not know that. He was wrong. Yep. I hate to inform him, but uh, yeah, sorry, Columbus. After Columbus, Europeans began more and more exploration of the New World, or what would later become called North and South America. In 1497, only five years after Columbus, John Cabot was sent by Henry VII to search out England's trade route to the Orient. Cabot headed north and is touted as the first explorer under the British flag to attempt to find what was to be called the Northwest Passage. Cabot and other explorers after him, largely British, believed that there was a channel through the waters choked with Arctic ice that would take them to Asia for trade. Hmm. Yeah. Think of it this way. Conquering the, Northwest, conquering the Northwest Passage from the 15th century is akin to our generation colonizing Mars. Wow. It's something that many believe we can do, but the technology required is still being perfected. And there was no Elon Musk back then. Yeah. I don't think so. No. Well, I mean, he could be an android. Unless he's a time traveler. (gasps) Oh my goodness. Many of the initial unsuccessful attempts were also deadly, but none so much as Franklin's expedition. Many Canadians will recognize the names of these next few explorers, who were all attempting to find that route from east to west. Further south, Samuel de Champlain and Jacques Cartier attempted their breakthrough via the St. Lawrence River, but stopped at Lachine Rapids near Montreal. Lachine is French for China. And Champlain believed early on, if these falls could be navigated, China was just on the other side. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Why? Well, they didn't know, right? I I know they didn't have GPS or anything. I'm aware, but it's just... It's funny. It's just how wrong could you have been? (laughs) The distance from the Pacific Ocean from Montreal is actually 3,692 kilometers as the crow flies. Yep. And then the distance to China from there is another 9,477 kilometers across the Pacific. So, I mean, depending on what how one defines uh, long, maybe that is a short jaunt for... Yeah, just go around the horn. How yeah. about that, like you were doing to begin with? Yeah, no, no. Yeah, some someday somebody will be doing a podcast laugh, laughing at us about a, 
how difficult it was to explore Mars. Yeah. And like, it just makes sense, man. Everybody knows this, the the surface of Mars. Okay. Yeah. Martin Frobisher began his trips to defeat the Arctic Passage in 1576. He chartered Frobisher Bay, which is now named after him, but was unable to find his way through the ice. Oh, so that, that was, it wasn't just a coincidence that his name was Frobisher and he... Frobisher and he, he found Frobisher Bay? Bay? That, I just assumed that was... There's, there's going to be a lot of that, Scott, just yeah. so you know. Oh, my goodness. Henry Hudson. It's full of coincidences back then. Who is the namesake of Hudson Strait and New York's Hudson River. Wow. Yeah. He found two. And Hudson Bay, the place, not the store chain. But that would be named after him as well. Wow. He took a run at the Northwest Passage in 1607 and 1608. After being discouraged by the seeming impenetrable ice in the Ark, Hudson took his ex- exploration southward to what is now called New York State. A little, little known state. <laughs> From Wikipedia's article on Hudson Bay... English explorers and colonists named Hudson Bay after Sir Henry Hudson, who explored the bay beginning on August 2nd, 1610, on his ship Discovery. On his fourth voyage to North America, Hudson worked his way around Greenland's west coast into the bay, mapping much of its eastern coast. Discovery became trapped in the ice over the winter, and the crew survived onshore at the southern tip of James Bay. It's pretty cold. Uh, Yeah, I would say. When the ice cleared in the spring, Hudson wanted to explore the rest of the area. But the crew mutinied on June 22nd, 1611. They left Hudson and others adrift in a small boat. No one knows the fate of Hudson or the crew members stranded with him, but historians see no evidence that they survived for long afterward. Yeah, I, I, I would, wouldn't be holding out any hope. The Cree, actually, in the area have some oral legends that say Hudson and the survivors from the small boat lived with them for a time. Oh, wow. Yeah, but we don't know what happened to them. Wow. Hudson's mutinous crew returned to England. Only eight of the 13 mutineers survived the journey. All were arrested, but no charges were ever filed. They probably told their stories and thought, oh, I'd mutiny too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, who doesn't enjoy a good mutiny every once in a while? <laughs> it's not a nice thing to do. Oh, well, isn't that, again, a matter of perspective? I guess so. If you're the mutineer, then you might feel it's necessary. If you're the mutiny, the mut- prob- mutiny. <laughs> probably not such a great thing. Probably not. As indicated by being left on a little boat in the middle of nowhere. From the 1600s through the 1700s, many more tried and failed to defeat the passage, including French and Danish efforts, along with Britain's repeated attempts. So what I'm hearing is there wasn't a lot of success trying to find this passage. There wasn't a lot, no. No, no. In 1775, a reward of £20,000 for the discovery of the Northwest Passage was put up by the British government. Hmm. The buying power of that amount of money would be equivalent to 3.1 million pounds today, or 5.27 million dollars Canadian. Oh, wow. That's a lot of cake. It's, well, depending, considering Vancouver, not really. Almost enough money to buy a condo in Vancouver. Yeah, you can get a really good garage for that amount of money out here. Uh, It's nuts here. It really is. In 1786, on April 16th, in Spilsby, Lincolnshire, John Franklin was born. He was the ninth of 12 children. What a name, Spilsby. Spilsby. Even though his father wanted him to go into business, or better yet, become a minister in the church, John was enamored by tales of the sea and exploration of the new world. So, I guess it was like their day's version of, I want to be an astronaut. Yeah, exactly. And Wait, did you say nine siblings? No, uh, no, 12? <laughs> he was, he was nine of, ninth of 12. Nine of 12, yeah. Good God. I know, his poor mom. My God, the, wow. Yeah. When he was only 12 years old, his dad set up his first journey at sea aboard a merchant ship. Oh, at 12. At 12. He liked it so much, by 14, he was aboard the HMS Polyphemus, where he saw his first action during the Battle of Copenhagen. My oldest daughter is 11. I don't even feel comfortable with her walking the two blocks to school alone. And let, let, let alone, alone going like, aboard a merchant yeah, ship. Exactly. Wow. He quickly became a favorite of the brass and worked his way up through the ranks. In 1819, after showing what he was made of for many years, Franklin got his own exploration assignment. He was to take an overland expedition charting northern Canada from the mouth of the Coppermine River along the coast 
down into Hudson Bay. It's a lot of territory. And it's very Arctic and cold. Yeah. This was a treacherous trip, with many men being injured and only nine of the original 20 men surviving. Jeez. They had been trapped by winter weather and forced to eat lichens growing on the rocks as one of their only food sources. What the deuce is a lichen? Well, it's it's the moss that grows on rocks. Like, you know, like a... Yeah. You see granite yeah. with that little tiny little bits of moss on it? Yeah. So That's a lichen. So they're eating moss. Essentially. Wow. I wonder if it tastes all right. Well... <laughs> it might not have been that bad of a thing. I'm just saying. From Franklin's own writings in A Narrative of a Journey to the Shores of the Polar Sea, he said, We found a species of corniculiaria, a kind of lichen, that was good to eat when moistened and toasted over the fire. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. It was probably yummy. Yeah. But I guess maybe it's yummy when it's the only thing you have to eat. But they did have something else. Hang on. Okay. It didn't stop with lichens. Don't, don't harsh my lichen buzz. They got really hungry. Anything made of leather also became fair game for eating. Uh, okay. Also from Franklin's writings. After halting an hour, during which we refreshed ourselves with eating our old shoes and a few scraps of leather, we set forth in the hope of ascertaining whether an adjoining piece of water was the Coppermine River. Huh. What did I say they ate? Shoes. They ate their old shoes. Yeah. So on a scale of lichen to shoes, <laughs> I guess it's really not separated by very much. I can't see myself being that hungry. Well, you know. <laughs> I, th I can see myself being that you hungry. You want to eat your shoe? It's like uh, I just think of Charlie Chaplin out fishing for a boot and he makes, <laughs> makes soup out of a boot. Oh, I get, maybe that's where he got that. Could be maybe he read a book about yeah. Uh, Franklin. Yeah. But, wow. And he, he just like, like drops it so nonchalantly. So while waiting for a while and before going over to do this, we ate our shoes and then we continued forth. Like yeah, exactly. Good old chaps And we that's are. the way it was delivered in the book. So that's, that's why I like, delivered it that way. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Eating old shoes. So on my way to work today. Whilst eating my shoes, uh, I was listening to a podcast. I quite enjoyed it. Exactly. Wow. Franklin was then jokingly called the man who ate his own boots. <laughs> uh, of course. That is how people get nicknames, doing things like that. Doing weird. E eating your own shoes. And they ate a lot of like leather stuff, including like gun cases and all this. <laughs> oh, hell. I know. Huh? Hey, you know, starvation. What are you going to do? Although these missions were rough, they were not considered a failure. Franklin had been able to map out a lot of the Arctic coast, leaving only 500 kilometers unexplored. Oh, wow. So he was kind of an important dude when yeah. it came to exploring. exploring Canada, essentially. Yeah, yeah. A few more commands for Franklin and more overland Arctic exploration gave him the experience he believed he needed to achieve that ultimate goal of beating the Northwest Passage. It's said he even learned to speak some of the local Inuit dialects on his journeys. Early in 1845... Sir John Franklin, now 59 years old, and a seasoned naval rear admiral was, was tapped to take on his longtime nemesis, the Northwest Passage. At 59. I imagine, like, hey, so how long you, uh, how long you been working at this career? Eh, since I was 12. 12 to 59. <laughs> well, yeah, that's how long it took him to become a rear admiral, I guess. But again, like, yeah, well, I, most of us, it's like, well, I started doing this in my mid-30s. And... and 59 was rather an aged gentleman yes, at that yeah, time, I yeah. would assume. Yeah. In the most expensive Northwest Passage expedition to that date, Franklin himself would captain the flagship HMS Erebus. The other ship, called HMS Terror, slightly lighter than Erebus at 378 tons, weighed 331 ton. Terror. Terror. Terror was captained by the 49-year-old Francis Crozier. A crew of 132 men plus the captains was split between the two ships. Mm. I didn't realize there were that many men. Each of these ships were technical marvels at the time and outfitted with the latest Britain had to offer. The ship's hulls were reinforced with oak planks up to 8 feet thick in parts, all meant to resist the massive pressure of the Arctic ice. Mm -hmm. The oak was also strengthened with iron plating inside. The ships were each fitted with a locomotive steam engine that could power the single retractable propeller and drive each ship up to 4 knots, or 7.4 kilometers per hour. Blistering. Well, not fast by today's standards, but astonishing in 1845. Like a steam engine on a ship? Yeah, yeah. I would imagine that would provide a lot of torque as well, so it's not always about the speed. Exactly. 
The steam from the locomotive engines was also used in a central heating system, providing sailors with warmth in the cold Arctic. That would be advanced for back then. Franklin expected he might need multiple years to traverse the crossing, as the window of open ice versus closed was very short. The ships were packed with three years' worth of provisions. Mm, wow. 136,000 pounds of flour, 3,684 gallons of concentrated spirits, a.k.a. booze, 33,000 pounds of tinned meat. 7,000 pounds of shoes. <laughs> no. Tin cans were also a newer technology. They were soldered together with lead <laughs> at the time. Oh, my God. How did anybody live anything? Well, this is good. This will come into play later. <laughs> my God. There was 9,450 pounds of chocolate, and that's where I'll be. Oh, yeah. You can have the 1,000 pounds of raisins. What, 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 I'm getting shafted here. Yeah, I don't like raisins at all. I love raisins, but I love chocolate more. There was 9,300 pounds of lemon juice, and that was to stave off scurvy. And, of course, 2,357 pounds of tea. Mm. You know, British, right? Pip, pip, pip. There were other goods as well. 2,400 books were aboard, 1,200 on each ship, 2,700 pounds of candles, and 7,088 pounds of tobacco. Oh, my God. As I'm sure will be of interest to you... They also brought along a daguerreotype apparatus. Well, what the hell is that? This is an early camera, Scott. Whoa! A daguerreotype is an early photographic process using a copper plate buffed to a mirror polish. The copper plate is then exposed to light in a camera box over iodine and bromine that reacts with the copper, making the photo. Is that what's all in my Nikon D850? Pretty much. Yeah? And oh. guess what color they were? Uh, they were black, black and white. And white? Yeah, of yes. course they were. Capture the emotion, man. Not distracted by color. The apparatus was used to take the photos of the officers and the ship's cargo after loading. But it's unknown if this was ever used during the trip, as it has yet to be found. Mm. You'll find a full list of the provisions in our show notes. I wonder how big that camera was. Uh, I'm imagining quite substantial. I, one would think. Yeah, it's pretty much a wet plate. The Franklin Expedition was by far the best equipped expedition yet, and when they set off on the 19th of May... It was to much fanfare. Yeah. The British were going to conquer the Northwest Passage once and for all. They cockily went off, not really understanding what lay ahead. In July of 1845, the ships pulled into port in Disco Bay. That's Disco with a K, not a C. Same, so it's not same, Disco same. Duck or... Same, same. Yeah. And that's in Greenland. The crew sent letters home, and five men were also sent back. I don't know why it didn't really get into that. Hmm. Maybe they were sick or... Oh, yeah, just and wanted. this left a total of 129 souls aboard the ships. The last Europeans to see HMS Erebus and Terror, still with their final 129 crew, was in late July 1845 near Baffin Bay. Already halfway through summer, after a quick trip north around Cornwallis Island, the two ships headed south. Two years passed, with no word other than the letters that had been sent from Greenland. Dun, dun, dun. Lady Franklin knew there was a problem and began to talk to members of the Parliament, newspapers, and anyone else who would listen. She begged for a search party to be sent out to find Sir John and the 128 others. That was after two years? After she, two she... years. Wow. So I guess you don't start to panic until you haven't heard anything for two years? Well, it's like, you know, when somebody's missing now, they say you, you know, wait 40 hours. 48 hours. Four hours. I, I guess the expression back then was give it two years. Just give it two Give years. it two years and then call us. It's crazy, right? It really is. Because you're pretty good with time, Mike. And so, I mean, a lot can happen in two years. Fair enough. Yeah, a lot can happen in two years. The public, too, began demanding something be done. Three search parties were to be sent to the Arctic, attacking the problem from all sides. Mm -hmm. wow. One group would be sent overland. Another group would approach from the east, where Terror and Erebus were last seen. And the last group would come from the west, having sailed around the Horn of Africa. Like, so you're already, like, missing for two years. How long does it take the search crew to get there? Like, another year? Like... Pretty much. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't mean to laugh. It's just, wow. So pretty much, like, you should... As soon as they... As soon as a ship leaves, 
You should just send a search party just to be prepared. That makes sense. I'm pretty much a genius. No one knew how far west the two ships had made it. Franklin's expedition could have been anywhere in the vast Arctic wasteland. The British Admiralty offered another reward of 20,000 pounds for anyone who could help bring the ships and or their crew home safely. Hmm. So there's another five million bucks for you. Yep. Now you with combined, you, uh, you can buy a, a one-bedroom apartment in Vancouver with, an, with a garage. Yep. And access to a gym. <laughs> A song was written called Lady Franklin's Lament around 1850, commemorating her obsession to find Sir John. One verse goes, In Baffin's Bay, where whalefish blow, the fate of Franklin no man may know. The fate of Franklin no tongue can tell. Lord Franklin alone with his sailors do dwell. That's not very upbeat. No, it's kind of sad. It's pretty sad, yeah. Yeah, but did they wait two years to write the song? Well, it was actually five years later. Whoa. Things happen a lot different nowadays. They do. Also in 1850, searchers found an unsettling clue at Beachy Island, not far from where the ships had been last seen. Beachy Island lays northwest of Baffin Island and just off the coast of the much larger Devon Island. On Beachy, the first clues of the ill-fated Franklin expedition were discovered. Near a large stone cairn were the graves of three of Franklin's crewmen. Petty officer John Torrington, his marker read, Sacred to the memory of John Torrington, who departed this life January 1st, A.D. 1846, on board of H.M. Ship Terror, aged 20 years. Able seaman John Hartnell's marker said, Sacred to the memory of John Hartnell, A.B., of H.M.S. Erebus, died January 4th, 1846, aged 25 years, and ominously, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That's from Haggai 1, verse 7. Royal Marine, Private William Brain's marker read, Sacred to the memory of William Brain, R.M. of HMS Erebus, died April 3rd, 1846, aged 32 years. And it also read, Choose ye this day who you will serve. Joshua 24, verse 15. Hmm, so that, that that was pretty close to when they set off from Baffin Bay then. Yes. So that, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. It's essentially when they were last seen, it's uh, around five months before people started to die. Yeah, yeah. Which is what the heck is going on? Because yeah. the two first who died were Torrington at 20 years old. Yeah. And then sense. very quickly after that, at 25 years old, John Hartnell. Yep. Uh, and... Brain didn't actually die until April 3rd of that year, which was just a few months later. So yeah, they were all pretty close together. It would have been interesting to find out what, they're, what they died from. I'm well, sure guess I'm... what, Scott? Oh, do we find out? Also found nearby were the remnants of tin cans that had formerly held the provisions. You know, the ones held together with lead. I, I do. In 1984, yeah. uh, as part of a, an expedition... To figure out what killed these men, yep. Dr. Owen Beatty, a Canadian anthropologist from the University of Alberta, excavated the site to determine what had happened. Yeah, yeah. The bodies were buried shallowly in the permafrost and found to be well preserved due to the cold. Oh, wow. You can even see the eyelashes and determine eye color in some of the photos and documentary footage that's available. Yeah, it's really quite incredible how well preserved they were for, for about 150 years of... Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Autopsies were performed on both men, and gas chromatograph testing was done on the bones to determine whether some kind of poisoning had taken place. I, I was going to suggest gas chromatograph guesting. Okay. <laughs> we talked about gas chromatograph before in the Lester Lawrence. Yeah, of course. That's why I was going to suggest it again here. Oh, okay, yeah. fair enough. Lead was suspected, of course, and these tests actually confirmed that... They believed the cause of death was lung disease in the form of tuberculosis mm. brought on by a weakened state due to lead poisoning. Wow. Although the bones of all the men did show a lot of lead exposure over time, there was a massive jump in the months prior to death, most likely attributable to the soldering in the fancy tin cans. Lead poisoning is painful. Some symptoms include irritability, loss of appetite, weight loss, sluggishness, and fatigue, abdominal pain, vomiting, seizures, and neuromuscular tremors, anemia, and blindness can occur. One of the men had gone blind prior to his death 
giving even more credence to mm. this theory of lead poisoning. I'm pretty sure I have lead poisoning. That's what I was just going to yeah, ask. Pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Another researcher had suggested that perhaps botulism had caused the crew members' deaths. Mm. However, this was all disputed by more complete studies in 2013 and 16 using newer technology not available in the 80s. These studies suggest that lead poisoning was not the cause of death oh. in any of the three men, even oh. though the lead was present. In fact, it may simply have been complications due to malnutrition, specifically zinc deficiency, most likely due to a lack of meat in their diet. Mm, okay. So they they completely ruled out Ebola? Ebola has been ruled out. Oh, damn. I found this theory odd, though, as there were many thousands of pounds of meat aboard and these men started to die... Uh, like less than six months after. Yeah, that's true. So, I mean, sure, maybe, maybe the toenail that they analyzed, which it was a toenail, did show that there was a lack of zinc there, but I don't think that tells the entire story. Yeah, no, I, I got your back on that one. Perhaps all the meat had gone bad, though, somehow. There was all those empty tins of stuff laying around, so who knows? The interesting thing is also that they're, the cairn there, usually British Royal Marines would build a cairn when they had camped in a place and leave a note. Hmm. And in this case, they left no note. Oh, okay. So essentially what was to happen, a form was to be filled out with a brief history of since last contact and a future direction of travel. Searchers didn't know where they'd gone after uh, okay. that. Okay, yeah. It's unknown why they didn't leave the note at all or whether it had been destroyed or lost somehow over mm -hmm. time. Because yeah. it was like a couple of years later when this was found. Yep. A good chunk of time passed and, you know, wind and such. Yeah. Robert McClure led the party coming from the West. After four long winters in the ice, requiring himself also to be rescued at the end, McClure was actually determined to be the first to actually traverse the Northwest Passage wow. in 1854. Wow. The irony was that he was helping to search for, but did not find any evidence of Franklin's expedition. So that's kind of hard to ignore. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm here to, I'm, I'm a search party. Oh, wait, I actually accidentally did what you were trying to do. I'm not even here to do what you were doing. But I did but it. But I did it and you couldn't. Yeah, that, that would really suck. Yeah, it would. Yeah. yeah. Although there is some controversy around McClure's claims and his claims to that uh, achievement, he was given a 10,000 pound reward and a knighthood. I thought it was 20,000, but somehow I guess he got halved out of it. Probably because he didn't find the actual crew or anything. The no, but the, there was the 20,000 pound reward for just traversing. Oh, the, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh. He should have gotten, I think he got ripped off. I think so. Can we, can we file a complaint? I don't think anybody would pay any attention to us. Mm -hmm. John Ray was leading the Overland Party, also searching for the lost expedition. On the 21st of April, 1854, at Pelly Bay, known as Kugaruk, Nunavut, almost nine years after Erebus and Terror left England, John Ray met an Inuit woman who told him a disturbing tale. Oh. Near the mouth of the Back River, 35 to 50 white men had apparently starved to death just a few years before. Hmm. He paraphrased what she said. Some of the bodies had been buried, probably those of the first victims of famine. Some were in tent or tents, others under the boat, which had been turned over to form a shelter, and several layers scattered about in different directions. Of those found on the island, one was supposed to have been an officer, as he had a telescope strapped over his shoulders, and his double-barreled gun lay underneath him. From the mutilated state of many of the corpses and the contents of the kettles, it is evident that our wretched countrymen had been driven to the last resource, cannibalism, as a means of prolonging existence. Well, I mean, it, it's, it's happened. It's happened in... Uh... Many times. Yeah. The Inuit name of the place has since become Starvation Cove. Because they will name a place for something that's happened. An event, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or many whales cove or many, many bears cove or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something that's meaningful. Yeah, I don't think I'd want to go camping at Starvation Cove. No. As a name, it would scare me a lot. Polite British society refused to believe that men the stature of Franklin and Crozier and those in their ships would ever stoop to such a horrific thing as cannibalism. No Brit would ever do that, they mm. thought. Well, why don't they go for a hike across the Northwest Passage? 
Yeah, and see what happens yeah. when they get lost. Exactly. Even Charles Dickens came out and wrote how disgusted he was with uh, Ray's account. Oh, really? Eh? Oh, yeah. Ooh, wow. Ray did bring back silver cutlery that had been saved by the Inuk and turned out it had belonged to Crozier and some of the other crew members. Mm. There's great care taken in the preservation of oral history by the Inuit people. Yep. As it's not only integral to their cultural survival, but their physical survival as well. Mm. They need to be able to describe where something is exactly, very accurately, so yes. it will be easy to find. Oh, uh, very. So the rest of the people can survive. That's a very good point. Yeah. Brilliant. A later search from 1878 to 1880 revealed much more detail and quotes that came directly from, we presume, the same speaker. Her name was Tatachiak. Her testimony comes from Heinrich Klukchak's book, Overland to Starvation Cove. This relates experiences in a small search party led by U.S. Cavalry in 1878 to where, it's believed, Franklin's expedition mm. may have vanished. Mm. Quote, and this is the woman's words. I have never seen Franklin people alive, but I found skeletons and a body near the beach in a small inlet. I was then accompanied by my husband, my adopted son Ibro, who is here today, and seven other Inuit. The boat we found lay on its keel, and in it were some skeletons, but I cannot recall the number. Outside the boat, I saw four skulls and other human bones. Only one body still had some skin and hair. It was blonde. Last mentioned person could have died only the previous winter or spring and was well preserved, although foxes and wolves appeared to have been gnawing at the body. I definitely remember that this man had spectacles and snow goggles lying near him. He wore a ring on his finger, earrings, and a watch fastened to them by means of a chain. Another quote from another Inuk woman named Alaniak. She related... In the company of my husband, who has since died, and two other families, we were on King William's land to hunt seals in the vicinity of Washington Bay near Cape Herschel. We met a party of whites walking along the southeast. They were about ten in number and were pulling a boat on a sledge. At first we were afraid, but when some of the whites came up to us, we engaged in conversation with them by sign language. They all looked thin, starved, and ill. They were black around the eyes and mouth and were not wearing any fur clothing. Jeez. Oh, One man who was dressed much fancier than the others, some assumed him to be Crozier, did all the communicating, using any words like hungry and eat and sign language to get his message across. Mm -hmm. Alanya claimed she and her husband gave the men some seal meat and camp with them for four whole days. Alanya said she and her husband left when it looked as though the ice might break up leaving them unsafe. Mm. The white men yelled after them for a time to come back, but the hunters carried on. They didn't see the men alive again. Oh, wow. She went on to say, the following spring, we were in the vicinity of Terror Bay, and there on a small hill with extremely little snow on the ground, I found a tent with skeletons lying outside. About two of them were covered with sand and small stones. There were also skeletons lying inside the tent, covered with clothes and blankets, as well as various articles such as spoons, knives, watches scattered about. <sighs> wow. She and her people took anything that was useful and left the site. In the 20th century, these sites were thoroughly explored by scientists and archaeologists. The remains were studied closely. The suspicions of cannibalism among some of the expedition survivors were confirmed. There were clear indications of tool marks on the bones indicating they'd been stripped of their meat. Man, that's a pretty distinct tell. So if starvation didn't get people, the element surely did. Many froze to death. Hey, I can imagine, I can only imagine how, how hellish this whole thing must have been. I would imagine just like the ship ride to... Well, I can't imagine the ship ride being bad. Oh, I don't think it would have been great. Why? Being on an old ship, like that's hard work. Sure. 
So I imagine like that, you're like, well, that's what they signed up for. Yeah, I know, but it doesn't mean it's not going to be fatiguing. So they get to yeah. where they, they're supposed to be going and, and they're like, oh, that was harsh. And then, oh, well, now we're stuck. And hey, how about we do even more stuff now and try to hike across the continent? Right. Here's the symptoms of hypothermia in case you were wondering. I was wondering. Shivering, which may stop as hypothermia progresses. Shivering is actually a good sign of the person's heat regulation systems are still active. Shallow breathing, that's slow. Confusion and memory loss. Drowsiness or exhaustion. Slurred or mumbled speech. Loss of coordination, fumbling hands and stumbling steps. A slow, weak pulse. In severe hypothermia, a person may be unconscious without obvious signs of breathing or even a pulse. That's severe. It's said that some people in the final stages of hypothermia engage in what's called paradoxical undressing. Yeah. Their core heats up and they lose rationality as the blood flows away from their brain, so they'll strip off their clothes, believing that they need to cool themselves down, even though they're freezing to death. Pretty sure I got it. <laughs> you have everything. I do. Here. Well, you know. You're a hypochondriac is what you are. Mm, I'm sure. What are the symptoms of that? <laughs> In 1854, the British Admiralty called a halt to official searches and declared all 129 men lost. Hmm. The clues kept turning up. In 1855, near Montreal Island, close to Back River, a piece of wood inscribed with Erebus was found, as well as another that said, Mr. Stanley, who was the surgeon aboard Erebus. Mm, that's a pretty good uh, bit of evidence. Yeah, absolutely. A smaller sledge party scouring King William's Island turned up a cairn with a note. There's the note we've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. This indicated what had gone on into at least 1848. Oh, wow. Okay. Here's what the letter says. On the 28th of May, 1847, HMS ships Erebus and Terror wintered in the ice. Having wintered in 1846 and 1847 at Beachy Island, after having ascended Wellington Channel and returned by the west side of Cornwallis Island. So they went up around Cornwallis mm. Island after Beachy Island. Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition, all well. So great. Okay, yes. so that's 1847. They don't mention the three men dying, but maybe that was it. Party consisting of two officers and six men left the ships on Monday, May 24th, 1847. So just to, to look around. Mm -hmm. And G.M. Gore, lieutenant, was the one reporting. A year later, in 1848, the same note had an addendum made to it. Oh. The new annotation said, April 25th, 1848, H.M. ships Terror and Erebus were deserted on the 22nd of April, five leagues north-northwest of this, hmm. having been beset since the 12th of September, 1846. Wow. Stuck in the ice. Wow, two years. The officers and crews, consisting of 105 souls under the command of Captain F.R.M. Crozier, Sir John Franklin, died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date Nine officers and 15 men. And that signed the new captain, James Fitjames, who is now captaining the Erebus, and F.R.M. Crozier, captain and senior officer of terror. Hmm. Two years later, only nine officers and 15 men had passed? Had passed. Wow. So that yeah. means a lot of people survived for a chunk of time. A chunk of time. Wow. Food for three years. And it sounded like their food had already <laughs> started to run out at points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. Sadly, Sir John Franklin was one of the nine officers to have perished, and the ice had not melted at all. They'd been stuck. Why hadn't the ice melted in summer? So scientists look into that. Mm -hmm. That was one Good. of the questions <laughs> that uh, people had around this. Global warming? Apparently, based on ice core records taken by climate scientists, the Franklin expedition happened during a 30-year span of cold weather and was determined to be the least favorable time regarding Arctic ice conditions in the last 700 years. Oh, damn. What luck. <laughs> yeah, it was crappy timing. No kidding. what it was. Like, oh, okay, oh. yeah, let's do it now. Okay, yeah. sure. P.S., this is going to be the worst time to do it. <laughs> in 700 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So where were the ships? That was the real mystery. According to Overland to Starvation Cove... 
Some 15 to 20 miles north-northwest and seaward of Cape Felix is the location where, on September 12, 1846, Sir John Franklin's ships were permanently prevented by ice from further progress. Mm -hmm. But what became of them after that? Were, were they crushed in, to bits in the ice? That's what I was going to say. I would imagine that over time, yeah, as the ice and whatnot Did they just shifts, float away or? I would imagine they got crushed in the ice. It wouldn't be until 2014 that Erebus was discovered by Parks Canada research team oh. led by Ryan Harris and Mark Andre Burney. Mm -hmm. And it was found underwater by sonar and it's almost entirely whole really eh? wow i mean the masts are gone because the ice has ripped them off mm -hmm. kind of thing in 2016 it was terror's turn ironically it was found in terror bay just what? off king williams island <laughs> far south of where it had been predicted mm -hmm. and some real interesting technology went into finding this. I'll post some some links, but it was uh, it's too much to actually get into. Yeah, yeah. Both wrecks are designated National Historic Sites of Canada. I uh, yeah, I would imagine so. In 2017, the British Defence Minister Sir Michael Fallon announced that England was gifting the Erebus and Terror for safekeeping as a part of Canadian heritage. Britain would only keep a few relics, the gold and the right to repatriation of any human remains found. Yeah, yeah. Here's some audio from Global News about the announcement. Our situation is more dire than you may understand. Sir John Franklin's 1845 attempt to find a Northwest Passage came to a gruesome end, as told in the new drama series, The Terror. Historians know little about what really happened after the Erebus and Terror got trapped in Arctic ice. And now it's up to Canada to find out. With the stroke of a pen, the United Kingdom gifted the sunken ships and everything on board to Canada and the Inuit. Dives are already being planned to find more artifacts. The Holy Grail being uh, captain's logs and journals and things like that, and in Arctic conditions, it's entirely possible that they could be preserved. Now this deal means that logbook and any new finds will belong to Canada and Nunavut. The UK gets to keep 65 artifacts already surfaced, like Erebus's bell. This is part of our history too, and the important thing was to have a representative selection of the, of the artifacts so that people in the UK would also uh, be able to remain in touch with this, this story. Now, the Inuit are key players in this story as the first people to discover the ships. Being gifted the wrecks is part of the reconciliation process, but it doesn't address a fundamental problem. Ironically, Nunavut is the only jurisdiction in Canada without a museum that would allow us the phys uh, to physically receive any artifacts. There are plans to build a heritage centre, but not for at least a few years. It's astounding how much is there. Now, getting new artifacts won't be easy. Besides battling the freezing waters, there's just a six to eight week window when they can dive the wreck. Still, they can't wait to get down there. If you talk to my team, um, this is probably their career file. A chance to find new clues and finally unlock the century and a half mystery behind the Franklin expedition. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Pretty cool. Yeah, I love the thought that the uh, captain's logs could be uh, still uh, legible, like still uh, uh, retrievable because of the cold. Like, that's pretty dope. Yeah, it's very fascinating. Yeah. And I also really, really like the fact that the Inuit people are being recognized in this way because they were telling people for years yes. where the where they thought these yeah. wrecks were. They were like, it's over there. Well, as you and, <laughs> as you mentioned, like the Inuit storytelling is some really powerful and accurate stuff. Like it, 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 a lot of heritage is preserved through that storytelling and accurately so as evidence here. Yeah. So was it just bad luck for Franklin and his men? how they fell victim to the unpredictable and often cruel Arctic environment? Did arrogance kill them? Like in the case of the unsinkable Titanic, had Mother Nature squelched the idea that she could be beaten on her home turf, one of the most inhospitable regions on the planet? Things are never one simple solution, so it's probably a combination of everything. Sure. But, uh, I mean, 
also that unpredictable time of the worst cold ever. ever. I mean, it was also a 30 year span, they mm-hmm. said. So, the, you know, in one's lifetime, that's pretty easy to hit. And that's substantial. Yeah. And, in, and once that's like half your life. Yeah. And so, it, you know, in, in hindsight, looking at time, you go, that was just a short blip. But during one's lifetime, back then yep. that that was a good chunk of it so it's not like they were like well i'd really like to do this uh, but i'm guessing the weather's probably not great let's wait 30 years yeah like, that's not gonna be you know, you know if you want to learn more about the franklin expedition and there's a ton we'll post some links in the show notes if you like fiction mixed with the fact to fill in the gaps I really enjoyed Dan Simmons' novel Terror about this case. Mm -hmm. It was also turned into a very well done AMC TV series last year of the same name, Terror. Yeah. Check it. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I watched a couple episodes. I never finished it through, not because of any, it's not like, oh, this isn't good. I was really loving it, but just other shows were on and stuff. I own it on iTunes in 4K. Oh, oh, do you? How many Ks? In four of them. Let me know when it's 4.5K. Four Ks. Wow. That's a lot of Ks. So, Scott, we mentioned off the top of the show that you're going to Australia for the next three weeks. That's right, mate. Right. So, next week, my wife Carol will be co-hosting the show. I'm totes excited about that, actually, because it's yeah. going to be fascinating for me to actually listen to an episode that I'm not involved in. Like just, I'm, I'm going to be a, a regular listener for an episode. That's kind of cool. It is kind of cool. And Carol will rep me well. Carol's yeah. awesome. She'll do a good job. She wants to do a podcast of her own at some point, so yeah. why not get her feet wet with this kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. It'll be a great experience for her. It'll be a great experience for the listeners. That's, you know, a lot of the meet and greet people have already met her, but it'll be great for the audience today. She's a big part of, of what we do. Absolutely. She, she, she's she good. really helps us out a lot. She's good people. She reads quietly, so she doesn't interrupt us. The week after next will be our Christmas episode. Don't worry. We've already recorded that, and we're taking a week's break after that one, and we'll be back in the new year. That's right. We have some great episodes planned for 2019 and are actually planning some with multiple parts to tackle some of the larger Canadian cases, the ones I've been putting off, yeah. frankly. And we're going to start with a pretty heavy hitter here, I believe, in BC. So, mm, Which one might that be, Mike? It's not Robert Picton. Oh, Wow. So wow, there you go. Wow. Before you all, before you folks get all excited, it is not Robert Picton. He will probably be the last person that yeah, we talk yeah, about. Yeah. But we are also planning some more really cool away games. I've got a list of about 100 that I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we better and, live a long time. And that's time. growing too. So we've got like 300 regular, <laughs> regular ones that I have, plus all the ones that people keep sending me. And, and they're so all, that list keeps growing. They're all written, right? Oh my God. <laughs> If only. And that's another thing. I've had some people reach out to me to offer help with uh, research. And because a lot of other shows have have help with writing and research. And it's getting to that point where we kind of need some. Well, when you're doing it weekly uh, for a year and the amount of energy and effort you put into it, it, it's tough to keep up. It is very tough. Um, I don't want to get too burned out and then just have to just quit the show. Yeah, yeah. One day, all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, we're not going to do this anymore because yeah. I'm going banoonoos. The, the show would be dramatically different without you. Uh, there'd pretty much be nothing. And <laughs> just, uh, here, get, here's what it would be. Everybody, hey, hey, so it's Scott. How's everybody doing? Uh, so you want to know what I did last night? I ate some Doritos. And... Well, people will probably listen to that show because oh, people think, like it. I think the numbers would drop substantially. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> like 98%. But maybe it would be just like Scott's show. Just call call it Scott's show then. Like the Gary and then, Sandling show? Then it's what people expect. It's like, yeah. Mm, no, show. I'd like to keep doing it this way. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Before we go, we want to give some shout outs to our new patron patrons. This week's good eggs are Amelia Thomas from Charlotte, North Carolina. Hey, somebody else from North Carolina. Hey. I kind of dig that. Wow. I wonder if it's a friend. North Carolina. Hello, Amelia. Thank you. Aaron McLeod from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Oh, Aaron, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sarah Carroll from Ottawa, Ontario. There's a great cadence to that name, Sarah Carroll. Right. I I dig it. And we have Jerry Katz, Lucy Beck, and Deb Barnhill. And Barnhill is actually a very Nova Scotia name. Oh, is it? I have a sneaking suspicion that Deb Barnhill will be from Nova Scotia. Hmm. 
I, I my last name was going to be House Mountain. House Mountain. Yeah. Okay. Barn Hill. Barn Hill. Yeah. Oh, Barn Hill is a, like I hear a lot of that in Lunenburg County, at least. I'm I'm just hilarious, Mike. That's all I'm saying. Oh, I'm just being hilarious. You are a legend in your own mind, Scott. That it counts. We also want to thank Dwayne Burke for his PayPal donation. Thanks, Dwayne. High Thank five. you. Yes, high five big time. Thank you so much to our patrons past and present for all your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. If you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpatine. Or for a one-time support, you can send us some donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpateenpodcast at gmail.com. So yesterday I saw a comment on our page yeah. about the Edmonton... Um, the hub murders. Yep. And from episode 50. Yeah. Yeah. And it was actually from Matt Schumann, who was the victim who survived the, the shooting. The surviving victim. Yeah. And we just want to say, Matt, if you're continuing to listen to our show, thank you so much. It meant the world to us that you, A, you listened to the show, and B, that you were moved enough by it to send us a little message. So thank you. Thank you so much. I can't I can't begin to explain how uh, powerful something like that is to uh, each of us. Yes, uh, yeah. it, it, a surviving victim uh, reached out to thank us. This has got to be such a sensitive topic for victims. Yeah, the cases that they're involved in, and to know that uh, he liked it enough to reach out and thank us is just. It's everything. It's it's absolutely everything. We really appreciate it, yeah. Matt, and uh, and want to say uh, thank you for your service in our military as a fireman as well. We we appreciate that too. Just thank you for everything. Uh, thank you for being here. Check out our website www.darkpatine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and any other social media that you can think of. I think I don't know if we're on anymore. <laughs> Just search for Dark Poutine. <laughs> I'm not on Snapchat yet. I've thought about it, but I don't. I, I've I, I've never gotten into Snapchat. You know, I, yeah, I don't know. I just never found it to it's be. It's a thing. Yeah, I know it is a big thing, but I yeah. I don't know. Our Facebook group, the Umber Yard, still needs more members. We're only at 1,300. My God, is it? We thought like, it feels bonkers. like 300 in a, in like a month. Yes, yeah, it is actually about that. Wow. You can subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher like iTunes Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Or call us and we'll just read the episode to you. And here I'm going to say that thing that you guys are missing from the beginning. Now that you've finished up this helping of Dark Poutine, grab yourself a double-double and an animal bar for dessert. You've earned it. Yeah, you've tolerated me. Until next week, don't forget to be a good egg. And not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.